Hi, everyone. Um, so we're going to be talking about the next generation of personalized healthcare. Um, and I have my panel here. Um, we have Ruby Saharan, who's uh, in charge of UK real world evidence um, at Novartis. Uh, Dimitri de Jonge, who's founder, founder and head of research at Ocean Protocol, or co-founder. Um, and Rad Uriri, who is CTO at Eagle Genomics. So um, I'm going to come and sit down next to you guys. <laughs> right, well, welcome, everyone. Um, perhaps we could just very quickly um, give a sort of uh, quick intro to, uh, to each of you. Rad, do you want to kick off? Oh. Yes. Yep. Is it working? Okay, good. So I'm Rad. I'm CTO of Eagle Genomics. Uh, Eagle Genomics is a software and data science company targeting life science industry. Uh, we have observed that actually the, the, the entire life science industry is shifting, especially in, within innovation, from. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> from wet lab innovation or pure wet lab innovation to becoming a data science industry. And what we are doing is actually we are automating the entire data science life cycle. We have a platform that is called the, data auto the Automated Data Scientist, and it starts from data curation, uh, analysis, exploration. But one of the key aspects is what we call data valuation, which is attributing value to the data <coughs> based on context and use. Thanks. Ruby. So my name's Ruby Saharan. I'm the UK Real World Evidence Lead at Novartis Oncology. Um, my role primarily is to work on the strategy of extracting patient data, um, utilising secondary data sets where possible. I've worked on projects uh, looking at predictive modelling uh, to predict outcomes for uh, patients, uh, for cancer patients um, on various drugs uh, with varying um, results which we can discuss a bit later. Uh, also um, looking at the uh, potential use of novel data sources such as social media forums that patients use to discuss things like side effects. Um, so yeah, I work mainly on the patient data related side of things. Great. Hi, uh, I'm Dimitri. I'm uh, heading research at Ocean Protocol. Um, we're playing with open access to data, closed access, uh, incentives, some sharing. Um, my, I think my knowledge for, on drugs is different than being expected in this panel, but uh, <laughs> I can say some stuff about data uh, and open data. Yeah. Great. So. Um, <laughs> Ruby, can we kick off with you? Um, could you maybe describe some of the um, some of the issues that you have um, at Novartis with dealing with um, these data sets that you talk about? Yeah, so um, I think I mean speaking from a UK perspective, obviously the main concern for us at the moment is speed of access mm. um, uh, of data, the acceptance of research protocols, and the speed at which. Uh, research protocol is approved. You know, on average, it takes about 10 months for us at the moment. And once we get the data, it's not in real time. So there is currently a seven to eight month uh, lag um, in the SACT data set hel held by Public Health England, for example. Um, I know they're working on that, uh, you know, to, to make it as close to real time as possible. Um, but I think those are probably the key things. It's access to the data. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing also is the curation. So, you know, the, the fact that uh, there's a lot of unstructured data out there, uh, the coding um, and, you know, the, the management of it at a trust level um, and the fact that there's a lot of variability across England, Scotland and Wales uh, so, you know, if you want to look at the national picture, it can be quite difficult because once you start aggregating at that level, the data becomes more and more scant. And what you find is data that's richest in, uh, you know, from the clinical perspective um, and most detailed from the clinical perspective is actually held at the hospital level. So those are just some of the key okay. challenges. Okay. Um, so, uh, Rad, you have some familiarity with the, this whole data curation issue. Can you t tell us a bit about, uh, about yes. that? 
So, I mean, again, I, I'm not uh, a scientist, mm. but uh, I'm a more a data scientist and a statistician. And then when I started working with the life science, the first thing that actually shocked me is that they have this qualifier that bio, bio something, bio curator, bio scientist, etc. And my question was, why do you call it bio curator? And actually, the, you find within this organization armies of PhDs and postdocs that they spend their time on manual data curation. It's very costly, etc. And the reason why they are called bio is because they have a lot of implicit and tacit knowledge that they add. So actually, in order to curate the data, it's not only cleansing or correcting the data, it's adding a lot of context, going back to the experiment, to the study, and trying to label or find actually what were the processes that have generated that. Mm -hmm. And this process is very costly. And yeah, that's one thing. The other thing also is that most of this data have been generated in different contexts uh, for different experiments. And the richness of the data and the value data is when you are able to combine these experiments that are not necessarily have the same purpose. So there are a lot of trends. At the beginning, we believe this will be genetic data or genome data, but then we moved and see, well, actually, it will be more multiomics, metabolomics, etc. But actually, we end up by having not big data, but constellation of huge data mm. that have nothing to do together and need to be integrated. Okay, okay. Um, so, can you talk a bit about the characteristics of some of this data? I mean, there's, there's obviously a broad spread going from these, these big data sets all the way down to sort of the individualized uh, data. Yeah. So, again, they have different characteristics. I mean, genomic data, we know it's very complex, but it's still there was some structure. Uh, if you take, for example, microbiome data, which is the data related to all the bacteria that is in your gut, or, uh, but also it has viruses, this is one of the most complex. Uh, so the complexity comes from the number of characteristics, fields, or attributes, or what we call in data science features. Uh, we're talking about 100,000 uh, features. So now if you just have a binary to say 0 and 1, so that's 2 to the power 100,000, actually there was no sample in the universe that can cover for this, especially if you are doing all the, uh, the combination. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know that this is very complex and there was no way how we can gather all the data. So I do believe that actually even the, the statistical and the maths still in this area, some of it needs to be involved. That's why, for example, in Eagle Genome, this is one of the area we are focusing on and uh, we have developed there. There are a lot of work uh, also going on real-world uh, data, which is less structured. Uh, it's very uh, time-oriented, mm -hmm. uh, but also is less rigorous mm -hmm. because it has not been collected uh, through a clinical or controlled. Okay. And all of these, but however, it gives a lot of insights. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Dimitri, do you have any, uh, any views on these sort of highly... Um, Fragmented and federated data sets that we're trying to pull together here. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's that's cool. Um, so uh, you you can think about what's the unrealized potential of data, and uh, that's kind of saying that well, uh, data might be relevant in one context and not relevant in another context, and now you kind of figure out like how to signal this. Um, so parts of the approaches that we're doing is well, we have uh, we're using a lot of blockchain technologies, smart contracts, uh, and these things. And, and we're automatically in a federated setting. Uh, we, the blockchain never sees the data, it controls access and incentives around the data set. And actually what we're trying to build is something that we could say data as an organization by itself. Uh, you could call it a data DAO or something. Um, and, and, and this leads to uh, the data having a provenance system, a proof and a work system around it, but also an incentive system to attract uh, for example, crowdsource data science uh, to, to work on that data set and give it an identity and community. As such, that it can solve one problem, the community and maybe some smart agents around that data set will have the capability to say that, hey, we did this uh, very cool auto captioning or object recognition on, on, on uh, long capacity and now we can use it maybe in different contexts like maybe in automotive so th these things uh, go beyond a single vertical I think we should think about what's the unrealized potential in a fully federated setting like mm -hmm. before I don't know if you saw the talk of Vinay and others and he had like a very simple example 
where, uh, and I'm just going to quote here, um, like say you have an allergy and you go to a store, you buy something, you have a peanut allergy, just to make it a bit more precise. You go to a store, you buy something, you, pr you swipe your credit card and suddenly it blocks because you bought something with peanut allergy. What do you need? You need information about what's in the food. You need to have information about, well, you need to tie this to your credit card, but also a bit to uh, some parts of your health profile. Mm. And, and this is kind of where you start thinking multidisciplinary. Mm. And that's why I think you can, can fully exploit the, the, expo the exponential growth of, of, of applications that, that, that can be solved by okay. federated learning. Okay. Yeah. Um, so obviously that that kind of um, throws up throws up a few issues. Um, so Ruby, you talked about some of these public data sets, and um, at some point that data becomes identifiable. Um, how do we sort of define where these sort of ethical cutoff points are for that, and where do we have to bring in technologies that are going to help us to actually obfuscate that? I think that's a really really important point. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned skipping between verticals, but. Um, the vertical of healthcare is obviously very sensitive. It's patient data, it's private data, and the individual owns that data, right? It's up to us who we share it with at the end of the day. And the democratization of data is great, but you know, individuals have to be respected. Um, that being said, I think there needs to be a consensus across industry, academic health partners, um, the NHS, governments, uh, to say, actually, this is gonna be our threshold if it's if anything reveals if an algorithm reveals a cohort of i don't know 20 patients in one geography that's it we cut off then nobody's allowed to go any lower you know because then that's the point at which you'll be become identifiable for example i mean that could be cool. but in, there needs yeah. to be some kind of a conversation and agreement there um, and i think once we start to define these boundaries of what we call um sort of almost this, the safety net of where we can operate then it might open up you know the doors to innovation mm -hmm. and and increased partnerships um, you know and less of the suspicion I suppose oh why do they want my data you know it all needs mm. to be defined clearly and publicly as well I, I agree and actually th th this could be a self reinforcing system where um, for example you you, you, ha you have to set, set some rules, right? Um, once you have those rules, you could, let's say you put them in a smart contract as a bounty with the bounty network, um, just from the top of my head. And then you try to attack uh, saying that design a way to re re uh, reverse engineer PII mm -hmm. or whatever. And if you can prove that you, d that you do it, you get a bounty. Mm -hmm. So you basically can create systems that are self-correct, a bit like uh, mm -hmm. I think even Netflix has something called Chaos Monkey, and yeah. they constantly try to destroy their own system mm -hmm. in order to improve it, hence creating resilient systems. And I think the, the regulator has to be become part of that as well, mm -hmm. okay. setting okay. targets. Right, right. I mean, wh what do you th um, how would you characterize the regulatory framework at the moment? I think that's the bit that needs to be worked okay, on, if okay. I'm honest. <laughs> yeah. Brad, do you have well, any? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, there are many aspects. I mean, just to come back to the, uh, the, the identification first, I mean, I think it's, especially when it comes to uh, healthcare data and personalized data, it's very complex. Mm. Because, for example, if you go for rare disease, I mean, you would really, you, it's not just a question of removing identifier, etc. You need much more advanced statistical and probabilistic technique to mask mm. Uh, the information, but at the same time, not lose the value of the data. Mm -hmm. that, that's really very, very complex. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of regulation, I think GDPR is is okay, but for me, it's not enough because, and I would like to take it more from a personal point of view to say that actually, first of all, it's about education. Data can save life. Mm -hmm. And f we have to educate people that actually giving data is like giving blood. Mm -hmm. And I do believe in that. That, however, if we do not put, it doesn't mean it's free. <laughs> we need to put the incentive and the regulation mm -hmm. uh, with that. And that means maybe some kind of data dividend or, or something well, uh, <laughs> behind yeah, that. Yesterday I heard it's easier to donate an organ than dona donate data Thank after you. your death. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 so let's talk about incentives a little bit then. Um, so uh, we talk, we're talking about incentivization of people to provide their data, but then obviously there's also incentivization of clinicians, for example, to um, provide to, to um, 
to provide good data quality into the system. So um, how, wh what are the ways that we can do that? So I think at the moment, what we've found anyway with the initial work we've done is um, clinicians will input things that they are obviously measured on, that the trust is measured on. So when you look at the data at a trust level for, say, patient waiting times, time that they, time from referral to seeing the doctor, things like that, um, the data is really good, <laughs> and it's almost you know 90% completeness and quite clean. Mm. But when it comes to simple things like who was you know which trust was this patient last at sometimes that can be a bit of a challenge um, if you know the trusts are not linked um, and the simple reason for that is it's the way in which the business model of the trusts is operating at the moment so you know I think that needs to be looked at in terms of incentivization for patients I think to be honest it, you know most people would do this for an altruistic reason, I think, and share data if they understood where it was going and what was being done with it. Um, it's the same reason people participate in clinical trials, for example. Mm. You know, it's the whole thing of giving mm. back. You know, if you're a cancer patient, um, you're on a life-saving medication, and scientists want to look and see what's unique about you that's driving your response, um, you know, be that positive or negative, in order to help other patients, you know, I, I think the vast majority of people would be happy to, to mm. share that. But again, it's about education, as you mentioned, um, for the majority. And I quite like the giving data, the, like giving blood yes. analogy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so we've got all this, uh, this this phenomenal data in various different data sources um, uh, that we're um, that we're somehow combining and and so on. Um, how do we actually pick the right problems to solve? Um, are we picking? Are we are we taking a hypothesis-based approach, or at what point can we let the data um, uh, tell us what the problems are? I, 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 I mean, yeah, uh, it it is it is a combination of the two because mm. actually, uh, I mean, uh, just to quote Picasso, we say that uh, computers are useless because because they cannot uh, ask questions, mm. and uh, what we have realized is that most of the time the value uh, is in the question and finding the question not. So uh, I, I mentioned this uh, valuation system that we built, which is actually how to attribute value to the data. And data, we start talking about data as assets and to say, well, actually, how do you value data? Well, you value the data by its ability to answer questions. Mm -hmm. So we went originally and we looked into Google Scholar, we looked into that, and then we came with a set of questions, and then we, we mapped the question to the data, and we attribute value to the data based on a number of criteria, not necessarily to go into the detail. But then when we did that, we started working with uh, some pharma company and others, so well, actually we can give you some questions mm. also that we have. But we would like, these questions are very confidential, mm -hmm. because actually by having this question, don't please give them to others, because yeah. And, and then moving on that, we start, we have realized quickly that actually uh, the most important thing is actually to help uh, the scientists or the biologists formulating the question. And these questions are often vague, ambiguous. And the more they are ambiguous and you are helping into clarifying this, actually these are the ones who generally lead mm -hmm. to better insight. So it becomes a sort of uh, collaborative, a conversational system that you have human in, in, in the loop and it's in the formulation. I, I'm a big believer that actually there was always a hypothesis or a set of hypotheses. They are not formulated, and by helping, eliciting this one, at least it's helped into knowledge sharing. Okay, okay. Um, so, uh, with all of this, this, uh, this, this data that, we've, that we're collecting, um, We've got uh, you know th this amazing capability to provide personalised medicine and and so on, um, but uh, there's also a dark side to that. Um, how do we gatekeep um, the uh, the solutions that, that are being created? How do we make sure we're using this for good? I guess, um, Dimitri. <laughs> well, uh, I think you touched on a very uh, good point. Like um, there's new, there's again it, data data leads to emerging powers and 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 they can silo that power and then in, in effect they, they would be have the ability to create a weapon mm. 
uh, on biological weapons and uh, in, it, it, and it doesn't have to be through weapons it can also be just manipulating supply chain of uh, who can ac get access to specific types of drugs at which price mm -hmm. um, so that gatekeeping for me is something that's um, uh, to be explored and 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 maybe that needs to go under um, institutional governance or maybe that has to just have the right incentive saying that well who actually owns the data uh, what's the interaction between the data aggregators and the problem solvers on top of that um, and and and, and it's breaking down the silo in, in, in more of a network mm. a network that fl where the value flows back to the endpoints to the edges and not get stuck within the walls of, of uh, a company mm -hmm. for example mm -hmm. so it's 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 a it's a difficult task. I, I think I, I see a lot of companies playing with open data strategies and, 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 and giving something back to the users and, and, and then you see regulators popping up with, with saying, well, uh, let's put uh, GDPR in place, HIPAA. There's a, there, there's a lot of other things. So there's it, yeah. It, it's difficult. Uh, I yeah. mean, but then you see also like things like XPRIZE with sustainable development goals. Uh, you see the UN stepping in, defining new set of problems that maybe everyone in this ecosystem like don't form cartels, but maybe form like open systems and and actually prove that they can contribute back to society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, Ruby, uh, obviously. Y you're at uh, Novartis, you have uh, you know, very strong corporate um, controls in place to make sure that, that things are uh, being developed for good. Um, uh, this, this whole problem around uh, data, especially when we're utilizing external data sources and so on, um, how well do you think that uh, organizationally um, the company sort of understands that, and not just at Novartis, but just across the industry? I think. So the industry itself is going through a huge cultural shift at the moment, not just at Novartis, I think across the industry. Um, you know, the healthcare sector is interfacing with tech really rapidly. And being really honest about it, I think our senior leaders, for the most part, um, also need education. You know, there is a lack of knowledge there. We need to include more data scientist resource at the managerial level, at senior leadership level, so that you know, not only can we see what opportunities there are, but we are really having the conversation on the same level as other, you know, tech startups or other companies that we wish to um, engage with. Okay. Okay. Um, so, if you, um, uh, Ruby, just to carry on that, if you had sort of one one wish for um, for how you would be able to improve things for for um, for your role to get get better insight um, into um, into these, uh, into this real-world cancer data and so on. What would it be? Okay, so if I had one wish, it would be that everybody at the senior leadership position, whether it's within the pharma industry, whether it's um, on the NHS side, um, has a clinician and a data scientist working together, mm -hmm. um, side by side, to define the strategy, define how the research is done, and how you know the outputs are put out to the public because uh, I find that that's not necessarily happening everywhere. Some places do have the idea there, um, mm. but it's very much in its infancy. And where I think we'll see um, a quick uptake of um, innovation is in those areas where they've got that. You need your chief information officer working hand in hand with your medical director. Yeah. Um, so, Rad, um, We've got Ruby's wish there. Um, how does uh, how does something like uh, Eagle Genomics help in that area? I mean, uh, Eagle Genomics will help in the area to explain that actually the data is is the product. Right. Uh, it's not a just uh, because t today m most of the innovation, most of the insights uh, will come from uh, the data. Mm. Uh, and but this is as Ruby said, it requires a huge cultural change. I mean. We still see that actually the data is managed by CIOs, uh, which is more infrastructure, more IT. I don't think that the data is an IT problem. Mm -hmm. uh, this it is related to many, many aspects. It is about asset management. It is about product. It's about innovation. Mm -hmm. So unless it is, and this is where we can help, is actually to allow the shift uh, to say, well, actually, we can help you to value the data and to see how this value or this asset is managed and tracked throughout mm. uh, the entire life cycle. Okay. And uh, same question to you, Dimitri. 
Uh, I would obviously wish for more wishes, and then <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's. Um, I, 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 I'd go for open source mo molecule discovery and supply chain, uh, like looking at how can we build the tracks towards having crowdsourcing and crowdfunding on dr drugs discovery, and then looking at how we can basically create a sustainable ecosystem that's transparent and where basically equal access to to same standards of living from the supply chain side. And actually there are people doing that, so I'm gonna shout out to a project that yeah. I endorse a lot. It's called Molecule.to. Uh, it's Paul Kohlhaas. Uh, they're doing some great, amazing stuff about discovery of molecules and how to redistribute the intellectual property back to uh, the community. Mm -hmm. and I think that's something to have a look at. Okay. Um, only got a, a couple of minutes left, but um, I just wanted to talk about the scale of these data sets that we're, we're trying to work with. Um, and um, I guess the question is, um, we, we kind of, we're, uh, we're told that you know, the bigger the data set, the better. Is that true? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is important? It's, it's the quality of the data, I mm -hmm. think, more so. There's no point in having a massive data set that gives you three fields and just tells you your patients age, sex, and weight, right? It's got mm -hmm. to be detailed enough and it's got to have the clinical information. Not only that, we need to do things, certainly, I mean, speaking from a cancer perspective, simple things like define what is the community going to agree in, real, in the real world setting, the point is at which a patient progresses. Is it radiological progression? Is it clinical progression? You know, it's just not as simple as just let's have loads of data and, you know, mm. the answers are all there necessarily. Yeah, Dimitri. Uh, Big data is terrible, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's slow. You have to move the algorithm to the data. And I, I've read something that uh, in order to train machine learning algorithms for autonomous cars, uh, it the, the power it consumes to train these models on huge data sets mm. is, is the equivalent of a few li car lifetimes of uh, mm. uh, fuel consumption. Mm. So, so we really have to be careful and I think really pinpointing down what's the relevance of this data, how can we go from raw data up to information mm -hmm. and from information up to knowledge mm -hmm. in a, the most efficient way. I think that's kind of what we need to target. Okay, right. Uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, definitely it's not about the volume. And I think, uh, I'll put it even higher, there was a misconception about big data. Big data, it's not about large samples. And especially when it comes to uh, personalized data, it's mm. about me. Mm. I want to have inference and prediction about me and uh, me as a patient. Mm. So actually the, the entire data science has to be invented <laughs> into that. So we are misnominating big data because it's not about big samples, it's about individuals. Perfect. Okay, well, I think our time is up. So thank you, um, thank you very much, guys. Uh, that was really, really informative. And um, uh, I think, uh, I don't think we have time for questions, do we? No, okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.